All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Molesburg panel, and uh, joining us on the, this hour's panel, our friend Brad Hirschfield, author of You Don't Have to Be Wrong, For Me to Be Right, and president of CLAL. And, of course, also since I said Brad was our friend, of course, Adam Thompson's our friend, senior partner and owner of the law offices of Adam Thompson and criminal defense attorney syndicated talk show host. Gentlemen, uh, we've had a lot of news uh, in the past 12 hours or so regarding uh, Baltimore and regarding the situation surrounding the death of Freddie Gray. And uh, what we now know, if you consider this much information, is that according to another prisoner in that van, uh, Freddie Gray was... Um, making noise uh, and sounded like he was be, you know, banging himself against the walls and against the uh, van and in the uh, opinion of another prisoner uh, trying to hurt himself or harm himself. We also have, according to ABC News in Baltimore, the medical examiner saying that the injuries that resulted in his uh, breaking of his neck occurred in the van, uh, not during the police arrest. So uh, let me ask you, uh, Brad, what's your take on all this and how does it change the narrative, if at all, in your mind? I don't think it changes anything yet. I think we're getting more information, and I think it's still really hard. I think both sides are jumping to say, oh, now we know. What we know about that van is the other prisoner couldn't see him, so we know that he heard something, but he couldn't have known what his intent was. So I don't know how we know he tried to hurt himself. That bolt, everyone seems to agree, does match the wound. The so bolt some, in the, 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 bolt the, in the van, I'm sorry. Right? The There's a bolt mark in his in head. In the back of his head that was, cons that that was corresponds. consistent with the bolt in the van. Yeah. Exactly. So something is going on there. Was it self-inflicted? Did they hit a bump? Was he already injured? As uh, someone else is saying, a relative of one of the arresting officers who wants to remain anonymous. The truth is... We don't know, and I think that's really hard. We don't have enough information. We're getting more data points, but that's why everyone right now is simply interpreting each new data point to try and confirm what they already believe, as opposed to waiting for real right. facts that we can know what's going well, on. Well, Adam, of course, the protesters and the thugs uh, jumped to the conclusion immediately uh, and did what they did. Uh, but I, I maintain, and I don't know what happened, but I maintain that if they had information that the officers were responsible, they would release that sooner rather than later. They're terrified, I believe, uh, that maybe they don't have uh, any information that that backs up. If the medical examiner said it wasn't the cops, it happened in the van, now maybe the cops should have buckled them in, and that's why it happened. But if the cops didn't beat him, uh, and, and why it didn't happen while they arrested him, if the cops didn't break his neck, um, I don't think the community is going to accept it anyway. Well, the problem with these cases, and, it, and it, it's over and over and over at this point, and Brad touched on it, is there's so many reactions and responses before everyone gets the full story. You know, something hits the news and immediately there's protesting and then unfortunately some bad eggs or apples within the protest group turns into looters and rioters and they're burning down stores and burning cars. There's violence, there's hundreds of arrests. It gets out of hand. Then some information leaks out. Well, maybe it didn't happen that way really. We don't know. That's why people need to slow down be more rational, get all the facts in, interpret those facts, and then make a determination what really happened. I don't have a problem with people protesting because they're upset that they think that there's too much aggressiveness with police officers and people are getting constantly excessively abused and killed. I don't have a problem with that, but do it in the right way. Do it peacefully. Why does this looting and all that that goes on is unnecessary? We uh, all can do better. But, but, the police but, but, can do better. Prisoners should be secured when they're in a van. That needs to be in place. Police should be wearing body cams. Even the back of van should have cams in them to know what happens right, in the back. Right. But, of but of course, Adam, of course, we had body cams on uh, on Eric Gard, you know, the Eric Gardner arresting officers, and people see what they want to see, and uh, people don't understand police procedure and what police uh, have a right to do and not do. We'll come back. We got a lot more ahead with the panel. Don't go away. All right, ladies and gentlemen, in case you haven't noticed, there's a new candidate in the presidential race who's taking on Hillary Clinton. I kid you not. Brad Hirschfield and Adam Thompson rejoin us on the Malsberg panel. Bernie Sanders, the socialist from 
Vermont, correct? Yes. That's where he's from. Um, the, the senator from Vermont uh, has announced he's running for president against Hillary, but he will say nothing negative about Hillary. That's what he's promised, which makes for a great race, if you ask me. Um, and uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Brad, uh, I'm, I'm debating in my mind, Adam Brad, Adam Brad, Adam Brad. Uh, Brad, let me ask you, I mean, uh, O'Malley, I think, I think O'Malley could pose a serious challenge um, everybody's teasing him that he has no recognition, nobody knows who he is, blah, blah, blah. No one who knew who Bill Clinton was either. Um, he's good looking. He's, uh, you know, he's, 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 I think he could take her on if he, if he has it in his, in his gut to do so. But Bernie Sanders, I think, I think it's pretty much of a joke. Are you suggesting Bernie Sanders is not good looking? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I'm no one to com you know, make comparisons about looks. Look, I think Bernie Sanders is running to lose, as they say. I think what he's trying to do is get into the race for one purpose, to force her more to the left. And I think that's his interest. He can't possibly think he has a shot at getting the nomination. The, his only support has ever come from the unions. They know better than to jump in and support him because they have to support Hillary because she's a likely candidate. You're right. O'Malley could give her a run for the money, potentially, because he's at least better known than Bernie Sanders is. So I, I think here we're looking at as a classic case of running to lose to put ideological pressure and keep pushing Hillary to the left, which I actually think has some benefit for whoever emerges in the Republican race, because they don't have to be quite as in the center if she keeps moving to the Bob, left. Bob Seeger, living to run and running to live. Um, Adam, what's your take on Bernie Sanders? Yeah, I, I think he has some ideas that are much different and going to expand potentially the Democratic base. And I think Brad, you know, Brad nailed it. He's going to move over a lot of the policy making to the left as much as possible to get some agendas done. But he better be careful that he doesn't end up pulling a Ralph Nader on the Democrats and cost him the election. I don't see him staying in. I think he'll hit the, the, the debate stage get these ideas out there, try to get some concessions from Hillary or whoever the nominee will end up being to consider some of those ideas, such as raising minimum wage, things like that. But, but of course, and Adam, he'd if he's, accomplished, he's going to go. If he was going to be Ralph Nader, he'd have to be a third-party candidate. So we, we'll see if that I, I, I would pray for a third-party candidate from uh, Hillary's left if she's a nominee. All right, now, the Boston Globe reporting today. You know, we have found so much out about this Clinton Foundation, including that they spend about 10% of the billions of dollars that they've taken in on actually helping people. The rest are planes and security and salaries and you name it, 10%. Well, now we find out, according to the Boston Globe, a huge affiliate of the Clinton Foundation failed to report its foreign government contributions to the State Department. And who is in charge at the State Department then? Oops, Hillary. Um, uh, when she was, uh, uh, when she was, uh, yeah, Secretary of State, she agreed to have her foundation submit new donations from foreign countries to the State Department review. Apparently, this uh, branch of the Clinton Foundation didn't do it. Hey, uh, Bur uh, Brad, oops. <laughs> Well, it's a big oops. Look, Charity Navigator, which is one of the most reliable put monitors in the field. Charity. It's not that they put it suspicion. They actually said we can't even rate them because their bookkeeping processes are so arcane, so Byzantine, so impenetrable that we don't know what we're looking at and we're professionals. So at the very least, they have a very serious problem. When you make a decision to take in that kind of money and hold yourself out to the world to be that kind of steward for good, and even the experts have no idea where the dollars are going, even if you meant well to begin with, something, the wheels have come off the wagon. I, I'm surprised because I, all I hear on Morning Joe and CNN is that uh, the Clintons have helped 430 million people. Um, I don't think that if you, they could, if you, that's a dollar a piece, I think that would be more than 10% of the $2 billion. All right, so Adam, let me ask you something. If a charity is, wait, Adam, 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 if a charity has, you lost it in email. <laughs> right, I know, but Adam, you're a lawyer. If a charity, and maybe this is unfair, maybe you don't specialize in this, but if a charity is keeping that kind of, those kinds of records as described by Brad, that a, a professional accountants, we got 30 seconds, can't even decipher it, can't they be in legal trouble? Well, potentially how a, an organization spends donations they get Unfortunately, there's lots of organizations out there where for every million, uh, millions of dollars they take in, a very small percentage actually goes towards helping people and goes towards all these other areas. 
if you do the research on it, you'd be pretty shocked by a lot of them. But there are, but there are some that 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 do uh, spend a, a good percentage uh, towards the charity. Hey guys, thank you, Adam Thompson and Brad Hirschberg. Thank, thank you. you very much. N uh, Minister Quanell X is next. But first, folks, we. have Brought back our viewer call-in segment, as you probably know if you've been watching the show lately, where you get a chance to talk to me on the show. So if you want to do that and weigh in on the issues of the day, uh, you need to contact us first. You need to reach out to us in advance of that. So email me at callsteve at newsmax.com. Callsteve at newsmax.com. Do that now, and we'll be in touch with you.